the first time you ever saw her was when you observed her in that bar that night at Richard Cranston's, correct? Yes, sir. The truth is that you were attracted to Nikki from the moment you saw her, right? I thought she was attracted, yes, sir. What really happened was you drove Nicole home 20 miles away, fully expecting that you were going to have sex, right? Um, I was hoping that we would. Um, it was leading from what had happened before and where we had spoke. It seemed like that's what was going to happen. When you get there, and it becomes clear that Nikki isn't going to have sex with you. When she attempts to go into her house and leave your vehicle, that's when your mood changes, right? No, sir. That's when things get aggressive, don't they? Not at all. That's when you grab that cord and strangle her, don't you? No, sir, not at all. That's when Nikki gets slammed on the ground repeatedly when she's trying to run toward her house. Brown County Public Safety, this is Therese. Yes. Um... How do I go about, uh, I guess, uh, missing person? Who's missing? Uh, it's my girlfriend. What's her name? Nicole Vander Heiden. 35-year-old Douglas Dietrich filed this report after his live-in girlfriend, Nicole Vander Heiden, didn't end up coming home since last night's party. This night out would turn out to be the most gruesome and twisted case in the history of Brown County. And where was she last seen? We're at the starting can and down, I think it's on the corner of Howard and South Maple or Maple. On Broadway there? Yeah, just off of Broadway. Okay. And then she was walking south on Maple from there. I was on in road. On the night before this call, there were half a dozen people who spotted the couple at the sardine can, but no one had any clue where she went. The only reason the couple didn't leave together was because they had gotten into a fight. When was that last night you last saw? Well, I didn't see, I didn't last year. It was probably about 11, 30, 12, I'm guessing. Okay. That's the last you heard from her? Yep. And I had talked to her on the phone. She was with a couple of my friends in a different vehicle, and then I was flying down there from the west. Now, usually, after a missing persons report is filed, the police confirm more details by meeting the caller and then carry out a search for the missing person. But for some reason, this missing person suspiciously matched the description of someone who was discovered three hours ago in a farm field. At first I thought it was a deer because of the rust color in her hair. Then I realized it was a young lady. Two teenage boys working the land that afternoon spotted what they thought was a dead deer. They quickly realized it was a woman's body and an adult called the cops at around 1.54 p.m. Naked, other than socks that were on her feet and a pink wristband. Other than that, we had no form of... There was a lot of blood. There's obvious injury, um, trauma on the side of her face. After this shocking reveal, the missing persons case turned into a possible homicide, as the dead body was identified as Nicole Vanderheiden. There were no identifying marks on the body or obvious cause of death from that position, but that changed when they rolled her over. There was trauma to her neck indicating possible strangulation, in addition to lacerations and bruising all throughout her body. Her fingernails were damaged, indicative of defensive wounds. Now, the police were still at the scene when Dietrich called on the non-emergency line. Now, the officers who were driving to Dietrich's house to get a recorded statement for the missing persons report knew that the body was found and who it was. But... Acting on this coincidence, they decided to withhold that information until they successfully understood what happened. Yeah, hi. 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 Hello. Hi. I'm here from. Okay. Um, I'm his mom. Oh, okay. I didn't know where we yeah. were going to go yeah. here. Yeah, just come. Okay. Hi there. What do we got here? Well, Dylan. Dylan? Do you guys mind if I take a chair? This is Officer Shield. He's riding along today. Can I move this? Certainly. Okay. Sergeant Tracy Holschbach later testified that when Dietrich descended his stairs, he looked pale and hung over. She had a close look at him, but she didn't see any scratches or marks on his arms and hands. She sat across from Dietrich at his kitchen table and secretly recorded their conversation using a key fob camera. Yeah. Is, so this is not normal behavior for her? Not at all. Okay. Um, and you guys live here with no. mom? No. Okay. There's this over here. There's this over here. The, you reside here. here. Yes. Yeah, just, just me and Bill and Nikki. So Nikki lives here. He's six months. Six. 
So she was out with you and some other friends. Who else was she out with? Well, Greg and... Um, you Greg? Yeah. Greg, what's your last name? Matthew. I mean, T-H-U. So give me the background as to what made her upset. So you're all out. You started out where? On the west side? Yeah, we were at, actually okay. we were at the... Uh, uh, what is it called? The Sandlot or whatever? There's a, there's a, a concert there. And that, that was over with. And then I spoke with her, and she was already in the car with my friends, headed down to the Sarnie camp where we were all going to go out there. Who was she in the car with? I, to be honest, I don't I okay. know. I think it was Crystal and Aaron and Darcy. Mike Gillespie yeah, was driving. Mike Gillespie, yeah. He, what time do you think that was? She was headed down to the sardine can? Um, probably 1 30, I'm guessing. Okay. No, no, no. It was after 11, in between 11. Okay. So she rode with friends down there. Was she upset at that point? Not. Okay, Not so she, from about. what you guys saw, you, she, everyone was having a good time? Yeah. yeah. No drama? Yep. Okay. So it's nor, is it normal for every time you guys, I don't want to say every time, but is it common that when you guys are all drinking together, she gets upset at some point? Or what, what do you think triggers? I know you're saying she accused you of talking to a girl, but does she outright tell you, like, I mean, yeah, I don't you were too close to this girl? Like, what did she say to you? She just sent me a text and... Can I see the text? What did she say? And this would have been, she would have sent you the text after she left then, right? Left where? Left the watering hole? The watering hole. The watering hole? I imagine. I just try to pinpoint the actual time well, she that she was last there. seen or heard from. And that would have probably been the 12.36 a.m. phone call that you yeah, had with her, Greg. Every time that we talked, every time we tried to call after that, the phone was just dead, so I don't know if her okay. phone died in her phone. But, you know, she never answered again after that, after that call. She, I hear it. She said, so what pitch you with? Oh, I'm sorry. Did she hang up on you? Was it pretty clear that she was upset? And Where are the well, right here. This that. is all her text. Oh, this is like, that was during the show. Yeah. I asked I mean, her where she was in the concert. Down. And she said that. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, at a certain At 11, point, 12 p.m. she said that? Yeah, so, she yeah, that's after 11 there. What did you say? So what? She was kind of hard. So what bitch you with? Okay. Why is she calling you abusive? I, I don't know. What does Marissa say? Okay. I don't know where she gets this stuff sometimes. Is that, is that uh, common for her to talk that way to you when she's been drinking? Sometimes, yeah, I mean... Or when she's sober. She doesn't drink that often, but... Okay. It's important to note that Vander Heiden called him a quote-unquote abusive asshole, which implies some form of domestic violence. Still, overall, he was cooperative, and after collecting the base timeline, the sergeant left. She never revealed to Dietrich that Vander Heiden's body was found, but it was revealed to her sister, Heather Meyer, via text. After the 10 o'clock news that night, the whole family was shocked by what had happened. As of now, the closest suspect is evidently Dietrich, but as we said, there were a bunch of people involved. So Let's go through the story of what happened on the night of May 20th, 2016. How, how did the night start? How did you guys all get together? We're all going to Steel Panther. Okay, who was all watering Who was um, a big group of our friends? Obviously you and Doug and... And Nikki, yes. Nikki. That group and I had all met at the same place and we went there together. What did you guys meet at? Well, Mike drove all of them and I drove my car. I, we met at Angela Cormier's home. And then Doug and Nikki met us there about 20 minutes after we arrived. We got there probably at like 7.30 and they probably got there at 8. So you guys got there at 7.30? Yep. And Doug and Nikki? Yep. They got there at 8. So then how did the night progress from there? Man, we were having a good time. Uh, a close friend of mine, uh, her husband was opening for mm -hmm. Steel Panther, and I hadn't seen her since she got married. So, you know, everybody's having a good time. We're catching up. And the concert ends. And I don't know how, why Nikki ended up leaving 
with our group of friends and not leaving with Doug and I. I don't know if she was just like swept up by the group and jumped in the car with them. They were going to go to the sardine can. So who, we were, all, who all rode together to the sardine can? All of those people on that list besides myself and Doug. I mean, I think all the rest of them. Jesse Cutler had showed up. That was a girl that might have also got it. I mean, he's got a big SUV, but I'm assuming that nobody else there had a vehicle unless Jesse had a vehicle that, so who some who drove people, to... that Mike Gillespie drove all those people to the concert from our original spot that we were at. Okay. And he drove everybody down to... I'm assuming that he did, yes. So when Doug and I were about to walk out, we saw an old friend from high school, and we started to talk to her and her husband for a little while. Okay, who's that? Um, Angela Fatla. She's got a different last name. I'm not sure what her husband's last name is. How do you spell her last name? F-A-T-L-A, I think. Yeah. So we were talking to her, just catching up for a while. And we were probably, you know, we probably were there for like 30 minutes talking to her. And the, you know, our group of friends that were at the water hall, you know, they texted us like, hey. But they had already left. They were already, yeah, they had left 30 minutes prior to us actually walking out and leaving. So I think what happened was, is when we walked out the door, Angela had called Doug to see where we were. And Doug answered the call. And I think that Nikki had tried to call him before that, and then she was angry that he didn't answer her call, but he answered Angela's call when he actually heard it because we were walking out to the car to leave. Greg gives us a third-person view of the events that night and takes note of how Doug picked up Angela's call instead of Nikki's. Many of Vanderheiden's friends noted an abrupt change in her tone as soon as this happened. And that's when the angry texts came in, like, and I'm quoting here, so what bitch you with? As Matthew explained that they caught up with some high school friends, which was unplanned, none of the friends who went with Vanderheiden could answer why Dietrich didn't join them. That's why she also texted, and again I'm quoting, what slut are you with because none of your friends know? Now at the time, Dietrich didn't get upset, and he just replied with, LOL, stop, and be good. I'll see you with the sardine can. But unfortunately, she didn't want to see him anymore. Yeah. And at that point, I think she, like, you know, they were on that outdoor patio at the sardine can, so it's kind of just like an open door to go out. And from what I heard was, you know, that she's like, I'm leaving. And she started walking, and our friend Aaron... This is where were you guys at this time? We were in the watering hole parking lot at that point when this, when this happened. So... What time was this about? I think probably, like, 12.15 maybe a little earlier, 1210, that we were walking out to go to the sardine can. So our friend Aaron tried to stop her. You know, he's like, what are you doing? You know, like, you can't just run off. You know, like, just wait. They're on their way here. So then Doug's calling her and talking to her, and she's, you know, yelling at him, and, you know, like, why aren't you here? Are you with some girl or something? You know, she's getting a little crazy. And, you know, Aaron had texted either Doug or I saying, like, you know, she took off, you know, I tried to stop her. So, Doug, you know, she hung up on Doug. He called her back. Who, was, who hung up on Doug? Nikki. Okay. Because at this point, we knew, like, she wasn't at the sardine can. And so then the... The next call, I I pulled into, I pulled in and I parked my car and I'm like, Doug, you know, hand me the phone. Maybe I can talk to her. She what time was this at? I think this is like <clears throat> the t- like twelve thirty that this like third call. You called? Yeah. No, he had called, but I you know I could hear her on the phone, kind of yelling at him. I said, you know, just give me the phone. Maybe if I talk to her, I can you know have her let us know where we, where she is so we can go and pick her up. Mm-hmm. So I talked to her and she wasn't making any sense. She was she was accusing me of being Doug, <laughs> pretending to be me. 
And, you know, I'm trying to be like logical and rational and just be like, you know, let us know where you are. You can't just go walking around, you know, we'll come and pick you up and we'll go, you know, we'll go back home. And then the call, I don't know if she hung up or the call cut out. But then after that, every time Dougie tried to call her phone, her phone was off. It went straight to voicemail. So I don't know if her battery died right then when I was on the phone with her, but when I was talking to her, she wasn't really making much sense. Did you know, any of her, did any of the friends say in which way she went? They she said left? that she went south, Aaron had texted that she went south on Maple. So I don't know if Maple is like the street where that bank is on the backside of the sardine can, if that's Maple, I'm not really, you know, sure about all those roads. So we, Continued to do well. Doug continued to try to call her, and her, it just kept going to voicemail. I we started to drive around the area and kind of like scope the area out and see if we could find her walking. And drove around for probably like 25 minutes, and we figured, well, let's go to the sardine can and see if she went back there. And by the time we got back, all of our friends had left, and she wasn't there. So we Did went. Did you talk to any employees of the starting camp? Um, not employees, but I talked to a bunch of the people that were out on that, out yeah, in yeah. like the open, yeah. What time was this that you went back to the starting camp? And this, I mean, this must have been at about 1, 1 15 that I started to ask people. And I asked this one guy, I'm like, Did you see a blonde girl, you know, out here? And he's like, Nikki? And I'm like, Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but. So he's like, yeah, you know, she left a while ago. And then I asked another guy, and this other guy knew, you know, said her name too, which I know that sounds odd, but Nikki can get very outgoing and adventurous, you know, where she'd be like, what's your name? You know, I'm Nikki. <laughs> you know, like, that's something I've seen her do before as strangers. So, I mean, I know that that could pop, you know, that she could be very friendly and talking to people, mm -hmm. you know, in almost a naive way, but so we stayed there for about 20 minutes talking to people and, you know, hoping that she would come back and Doug was still trying to call her. And then we drove around. I mean, at this point, it probably was like 1.30, 1.40. We drove around for a while again, you know, going up and down the streets, trying to find her. And then, you know, her phone is on, so we can't get a hold of her. And we had, you know, that maybe hopefully she got a, a taxi back or something. So then we went back to Doug's house. His phone had died by that point. And we got back there and the babysitter was there, you know, so the babysitter left and you know, Nikki wasn't there, he kept trying to call her. And How many times do you think he tried to call her? I mean a lot. Between, I mean, from his cell phone. I mean probably 20 times, you know, after it had gone down, after, 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 after that last conversation we had at like 1236, yeah. I think that was the time that we was dated on his phone when, uh, when he was talking to the officer earlier, I think that's what he said. That was the last time Dietrich and Matthew ever heard from her, or any of her friends heard from her for that matter. That drunk texting and call enraged Dietrich so much that he just assumed that she'd taken a cab home. He also couldn't spend much time out as they had hired a babysitter named Dallas Kennedy to look after their six-month-old Dylan. But as the two returned from a frustrating night, the babysitter had an awful view of the situation. Were you in the living room, a bedroom? I was sleeping on the long couch. Oh, correct. In the living room. I take it Dylan was asleep also? Dylan was asleep in his bassinet upstairs. I put him upstairs at this point. Okay, what room was he in? I believe his room, there was a bassinet and a bed in there. So I believe it was their room, also his room. <laughs> okay, it shared. So did Doug arrive by himself at this time? He was with a friend. Okay, did you catch that person's name? Greg. Had you ever met Greg before? No. Now, you had seen a few times Doug Dietrich before this? At least so about three to four times with them going out to dinner or just in passing, and he came to pick up Dylan once from my house, so okay. just very brief. Okay. So did you stay very long after that? Um, there was conversation, um, maybe about 20 minutes. 
And was Greg still there when you left? No. Greg had left um, in the process of me trying to leave. Greg had wanted to get out of there before I left. He said he needed to get home and he rushed out the door. Okay, so they arrived approximately 2.40 2 a.m. and then Greg left before you did. Correct. There was conversation with all of us though, um, sitting around just trying to figure out where she was or where she could have been. Okay, so you had been become aware that Nikki was obviously not there, correct? Correct. And at any point in time, did Doug ask you to do anything to try to find her? He said to keep calling her, call her phone, and yeah, keep calling her. And did you do so? I did. Did you, were you successful in contacting her? No, the phone was off every time. I kept stating that, that it's, the phone is dead, the phone is off. Now, could you tell if these two had been drinking when you saw them? They're out. I mean, I can't say if they're intoxicated. They're very large men, um, but they're loud and, you know, okay. concerned. And they, they seem concerned to you at this point in time? Yeah. Do you know how many times while you were there that you reached out and tried to contact Nikki? I would say at least four times, three or four times. Um, from my phone, just in conversation, and while we were there talking, I had called. So you indicated that you made those efforts. At some point in time, did Doug show you some texts that he'd received from Nikki? He showed me a telephone, um, and he said that they had gotten in an argument, and this is kind of what it was, and he presented me the phone, and it was a conversation back and forth between a, a male and a female of obviously a jealousy banter. Um, did she, it was the phrase something where she's responding to him, go talk to your horse? Something of the sort, yes. I'm not sure who it came from, but the message was across, like just go be with your horse, yeah. Okay. And did you indicate when, when you relayed this information to the police that it looked like Doug was trying to calm her down after this? I wouldn't say that. I don't know that I've said that. There was a statement that you gave, this is some time ago, is, was it a little easier to remember it then than you do now? No. Okay. So you don't... I don't, I don't recall him trying to calm her down. It was just showing me the text message that they got into an argument. I wasn't trying to be involved. I handed him the phone back and was just kind of like, you know, shit happens. Okay. But at that point in time, is it correct? I told you he was very concerned. He was. You ended up leaving then, I take it. You indicated... That as well, you drove there? Is that how you got there? Correct. Um, and after you left, sometime later, did you receive another message from her? From her perspective, she was scared, as she had only met Dietrich a few times, and Greg was a completely new face. They were loud and pacing back and forth over what happened to her. And after she read the texts, she came up with a resounding suspicion. She, um... Yeah, so just bantering back and forth, I had thrown out a few, like, is she with her sister? Is she with, you know, a few friends? Did, did she go to the next bar? Like, you know, shouting out anything. Where could she be? I don't know. Did she walk home? Did she walk over the bridge? Did you drive that way home? I pretty much spouted everything off in my head to him, and everything kept coming back. No, 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 no. So I finally had said, is she in the trunk of your car? And he looked at me, and he goes, no. Was that a weird response? Objection. Sustained relevance, what she thinks. Go ahead. You had testified earlier that um, Doug said he was concerned when he had arrived, running through things uh, or situations where Nikki could have been. So what did you do next? Um, I was grabbing my things, and while doing so, he had asked if I had a bowl to smoke. And what does that mean? weed. He wanted marijuana. He had, he had just came out and just was like, I need to relax. Do you have um, any marijuana on you? And I was like, um, actually I do. And then what did he do? He um, proceeded to smoke while sitting in the love seat and he offered me and I declined. And what happened after that? Um, just me trying to just be done with the night and kind of go just like okay here you do this and I have to go I really have to go and, and then I proceeded to walk to the front door 
I put my hand on the door handle and he called my name out um, to the point of startling. I'm right when I was about to leave and he had asked, he goes, Dallas. And I said, yes, Doug. And he goes, can you come back here? Can I hit that one more time? And I go, next time. And I and he's like, you're right, okay. And I opened the door and I ran for my car. And how did you feel at that point? Just out of place. Um, just, and I don't know, just an urge to get out of the house. And then what did you do next? Um, I locked my door. I looked around the cul-de-sac. It was quiet. Um, I stared into the garage. It was open. The light was on. And I just asked, where are you, Nikki? And then you drove home? I slowly drove um, down the road where the roundabout is to the police station road, which would be Hoffman, is that correct? Took a left. I drove very slowly down that road um, and went down Libel Street to the right. And then my house at the time was a few blocks down the road. So I only made three turns from their house to going home. Okay, and when you were driving home, you were actively looking for Nikki while you drove home? The streets were very quiet. Um, it was a little after three in the morning. There's no cars that had passed me. There's nobody on the road. Yeah. And when you said that you got in your car, you said you locked your doors? I was just frightened, yeah. I have no further questions. Any redirect attorney, uh, Kerrigan Maris? We have nothing further. We ask that you be excused. Thank you very much. His weird response was suspicious at the time. And seeing the kind of text exchange the two had, anyone could make that assumption. But with Matthew and Kennedy out of the picture, and Dietrich back home with his son, he wondered whether Vander Heiden had just gone to her family. And the only family Dietrich was in close contact with was Heather Meyer, her sister. Very controlling and very 
Like, she didn't answer her phone. He freaked out and, like, break up with her. And it's just... Is this, um, is this something that you witnessed, or is it something that Nikki told you? The one or? morning was, obviously, she told me, but, mm-hmm. I mean, I went there one morning. She showed me all the text messages from him. Okay. So how, tell me a little bit, give me a little bit more background. It's my understanding. You said she goes by um, one last name, but she went through a divorce? Yeah, she was married to Brian. Um, okay. And then she ran her head in last name. Okay. Um, and I don't think legally she changed it, but I know she liked to go by Nikki Meyer. And, and so Brian's her ex. When did they get divorced? Four years ago. Okay. And how is their relationship now? Um, he's a really timid, nice guy. Sometimes, you know how it is, and they get in their little tippies, like, why didn't he do this and this, and he should have signed him up for soccer, but didn't. And, okay. Um, but I think overall it was okay. Okay, it wasn't, there wasn't any hostile feelings at all. I mean, it was okay. Her sister has pointed out three things here. Number one, Dietrich's text messages where he called Vander Heiden a quote-unquote wild woman and wished that, and I'm quoting, she better be in jail. Two, Dietrich's quote-unquote abusive side, which explains Vander Heiden's text message. And three, the struggle in Vander Heiden's relationships. So far, the detectives must be building up quite a rapport against Dietrich, and on paper, he seems like the prime suspect. But the detectives still need more to fill in the gaps. Right now, it's just her words against him. Relationship was rocky. When, when, what do you know about that, or when did that start? That you became okay, and and so he's controlling, and um, he gets mad when she doesn't return his calls or texts. I remember also there was a couple times where. He basically, I mean, since the baby was born, hasn't really been there as a father, and he'll just go out and drink all night long and not come home. And then when my sister, she tells me, this is her side of the story, but when my sister asked, where were you, he got mad and said, it's none of your fucking business. Okay. And when was this that this happened? Do you remember? Not really. There's just so many answers. Okay. Um... So many just situations like that. She was like, it was every other day. She okay. was just really depressed. Okay. Was she on any medication for she depression? She tried. She couldn't do it. It made her go crazier. When you say crazier, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. She just let her thoughts in mind. She just couldn't handle it. Was she? Did she ever uh, discuss any suicidal ideations? She. Um, cut herself in the past. When was that? I was like two months ago. Okay. Before she met Doug, were there any attempts at suicide? Have, so I guess what I'm asking is, um, we're talking about depression, and depression can kind of come about for a number of reasons. It can be something that's long-lasting and or, more organic um, and, and last through your whole life. Or it can be a situation. She used to cut herself. I mean, we both say when we were younger. Okay. So we had a yeah. rocky growing up, very much so. Um, I had depression like in my entire family. Okay. And so she's been depressed for several years? Yeah. And so it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Doug's doing quite a bit of partying. Oh, yeah. Okay. And does what what sort of party is this stuff do? I did a lot of drinking. Um, the whole cocaine thing. Do you know that for certain? Or um or how how tell me more about how you know that? Well, like I said, the one time she had said him and his friends were doing it. And then just yesterday actually my brother's friend came over. He's not one that I take on me up. He was wasted and He's like, oh, show me this text message from Doug because he knows the way back. And he's like, Doug used to deal with cocaine. He mm-hmm. used to what? I'm sorry. Doug used to deal with okay. his friend, my brother's cocaine. 
I don't know how recently, but I know I know he's got a history of it, how often he does it, anything like that. I, I have no idea. Okay. So I, I may have misunderstood that now when I clarify. This guy said that Doug used to sell him cocaine or Doug used to sell cocaine for him. No, Doug used to sell him cocaine. Now the perspective oh, that we're getting is that Doug was a deadbeat dad who partied late nights and kept Vanderheiden confined at home to take care of the baby. There is another point to be raised about why the two separated at the sardine can when they all could have gone to the concert together. Perhaps Vanderheiden wanted to get away from him so that she could enjoy her time. But unfortunately, the Angela call thing annoyed her. Now, although we just heard from the babysitter Dallas, she left that night very uncomfortable and confessed something about that night only to Meyer because she felt that it was wildly suspicious. I don't know what it's about that right now, and it keeps trying to reach out to me. And that kind of pointed the finger at everything. It's just really hard because of I know your past. And a lot of me wants to blame it on it. Why? I just feel like a real boyfriend, somebody who loved her, would have let her walk alone that night. The fact of what Dallas said. Dallas. <sighs> the babysitter. What did Dallas say? Did Dallas talk to you? Mm -hmm. And my mom. And my Yesterday we found a lot of information out. She just said it was just so uncomfortable the way they were acting. He ate over and he's like, all right, we gotta go again. And Dallas is like, no, I need to go. I have a baby at home. Like, you need to stay here with your baby. And, he, and then she goes, where's Nicole? And he goes, oh, you know, she just wanted to walk home. She's been telling me she wanted to walk home forever. She goes, well, why would you let her do that? And she's like, well, I'm going to go drive and look for her. Do you think she's on Webster? Do you think she's on Libel? Like, where do you think she made it? And Doug's response, according to her, was she didn't make it over the bridge. Do you know which bridge? I don't. Because I don't even really know that area very well. But that's, that's what she said. He said to her. She didn't even make she it over the bridge. She didn't make it over the bridge. That is a very concerning statement. But the only reasoning we can see here is that he was frustrated at her actions throughout the night and gave this wild excuse instead of what actually happened. After Heather further tells her about her family, the interrogation comes to an end. And after a series of questions with all of their acquaintances, who were part of the incident, the sheriff's office calls their prime suspect, Doug Dietrich, for questioning. By this point, Dietrich and his family were in shock and grieving the loss of poor Dylan's mother. She was a mother of three, and even though Dietrich was a live-in boyfriend, you're about to see how much she meant to him. Um, Spider Meliola, sir? Sure. Less than two minutes in, and he's crying. You can imagine what the poor guy's going through. But at the same time, we've collected a series of statements that portray him as the bad guy in the eyes of the law. So now, let's see how he handles the questioning. Yeah, I gotta get on the All right, dog, I didn't introduce myself. My name's Lee Kingston. I'm a detective of Green Bay. I was kind of, I was asked to come in and kind of help out because the county was short some people over there. Okay. And it has a Green Bay tie with, we don't know if she disappeared from the sardine can or what exactly, okay? So, um, so what we want to do is kind of review um, a couple of things. Actually, we're going to 
review what you talked about earlier with, with Tracy. And then um, we had spoken to Greg okay. earlier, okay? I, um, and he kind of gave us a, a timeline of what you guys all did last night and, um, you know, what he did today. Yep. So, in an effort to try to connect the dots, um, let's start with uh, what time did, did you and uh, Nikki leave the house? I tried calling back a few minutes after that a bunch of times and kept on going straight to voicemail. So, I always just, you know, it's either off or she's on the phone, but for some reason, there's usually a call waiting on my but Right. So I was figuring it was off that it had died. Okay. She had been using her phone a lot, doing using Snapchat and stuff like that at the concert. So I like those drain the battery a lot. So I kind of figured, you know, the phone had died. Right. And she does get, she's bold and this goes, you know, with the other own thing. And with session that has any drinks and has no filters per se, you know, mm -hmm. and just will run off and... Does she take any kind of medication? No, I that I know, I don't think so. <coughs> she had been on something she had um, for depression, not when I was with her, but prior. She had mentioned that earlier in the relationship, but... Did she ever mention anything about postpartum depression or anything like that with yeah, previous two kids? Um, no, I no, didn't really discuss that actually. No, I think it might have been a possibility with, with. I think she was definitely, and then like, she was always a, kind of a social butterfly beforehand, before she got pregnant and everything, and liked to go out a lot. And not having that life after she's pregnant, and then cooped up to see a homebody as mm -hmm. a kid, and very, very great mother, and always, you know, never missed breastfeeding or anything like that. That's why. I, Besides a few, the one other time she didn't stay at home was uh, the other time I talked to uh, what Stephens uh, a couple months ago and she said that Andrea had burn cells and I don't know them. But where, and where did that where where did that happen? Where did that start? Bad time. Yeah. Um, that that was at I'm trying to think where what exactly happened that night. I don't know. If I had been. Oh, to her. Similar to this one, where she just kind of walked off on her own? No, it, she didn't. There was another time she did just walk off on her own. That was in the, it was like January, it was the night after. Yeah, it was well, the night of the Arizona playoff game. Okay. And we, had, we were at the ravine watching there. We had gone to the Bar East, meet up with a bunch of friends there. And she had got, uh, started freaking out on me at, in the bar. And she actually uh, hit me at the bar there. And like ran out, mm -hmm. and it was like zero, you know. And I ran out after. Uh, I, I was closing my tab up, and so I closed that up, and I ran out after. And she was running up um, lime, kiln? lime kiln there, not to the corners at a um, little auto place mm -hmm. on the corner. And then uh, to a squad, I pulled in and stopped her, and then I ran up and then talked to her, and she was this like belligerent with the officers there and they ended up putting her in the back of the squad car and I walked back to the bar we had a cab waiting for us and well it was on its way mm -hmm. and so they stayed there and we made sure then she got the cab and we went home and then I don't know what she was thinking she was just stuff in her mind and then she just goes. Remember how Dietrich texted Meyer that she better be in jail? It's because an incident like this has already happened, where she exploded on him, and then, after causing a public disturbance, Vander Heiden got arrested. Now, at this point, it's hard to pinpoint the cause of the incident, but it is a noteworthy part that reflects her outbursts. Well, just a couple quick follow-ups here. Um, when you guys went back to the sergeant camp, and you talked to these two random guys that... You didn't know who they were, but they knew who Nikki was. Yeah, that's right. Um, Greg, uh, we were asking around, and it yep. said it was her name Nikki, or Greg said it was Nikki, or they asked what was her mm -hmm. name, said Nikki. They said, oh, yeah, she was here. Okay. 
Yeah, what part of the Bob's that was? That, that was on the patio. That was outside on that back patio, like towards in between, like the door to go outside and the yep. bar. Okay. Okay, so it was outside the patio. Yeah. Um, as far as this Uber driver thing that came up, um, how did the Uber driver get involved? I think that was Aaron had called the Uber or okay, so the app or whatever. Some one of that group had called Uber. Okay, so who all rode with Uber? Do you know? Uh, then, well, according to Aaron, this is. I, mm -hmm. um, so this is coming through Aaron. You didn't yeah, see them leave with I Uber. I did not see them. Leave. Okay. Um, he said Crystal and Angela, who are sisters. Mm -hmm. Um, Jesse Tatler and um, Aaron. Oh, and Aaron and Darcy had his fiance, Darcy. So Aaron, Darcy, Crystal, and Angela. And those two are his sisters. And then Jesse, I think it's Barack I believe, is her married name. How come, uh, how come Mike didn't drive them all? I, well, Mike was a DD, and I think he drove. He drove everybody to the bar and home. Said Nikki and I, I believe, were in Greg. Yep. Because um, we kind of went to this, put this together last minute that Nikki and I were going to go. Mm -hmm. And I think he must have just dropped them off. I'm just speculating on that. You don't know that. Yeah, you don't yeah know. I don't even know. I didn't see them him driving from the watering hole at all. So I don't even know if she was actually in that car. That's what she said to me on the phone. In that short conversation after this, that was just after the concert, half hour, mm -hmm. 20 minutes after the concert. And we don't know if Mike was staying at the Sarnia Inn. He no, might have just drove there, and, you know, and went home. He's a father too and everything, so he had to get home. And... Now, while we don't have the interrogation of Aaron Kalinsky, he later testified in court about the incident. He claimed that she was baffled when Dietrich picked up Angela's call and not hers. She rushed out of the pub, and as much as Kalinsky tried consoling her, she was the opposite. He watched her use her phone as she walked off into the night. His exact words when he was calling her to join them in the Uber were, and I'm quoting, You're a babe in the woods! She never turned around. Aaron was the last person who saw her, but also he's not a suspect in this situation. Is there any other friends that she might um, reach out to looking for a ride or anything like that? Yeah, I don't know. Dallas? Um, we had um, her sister, I um, supposedly talked to uh, Caitlin, uh, who was one of her good friends, or was more of a good friend, and then Haley. Um, that's pretty much it. Then. Heather, that's the that's yeah. her sister Heather. She yeah. would she would help those mm -hmm. people. Yep. Your parents arrived. Did you leave the house at all? No. no. I haven't left since then until now. Okay. So basically, you got home at what time was it early this morning? Two thirty-three. Okay, so two thirty-three o'clock, and you pretty much been home from what you're telling us the entire time. Yep. At this point, the detectives are just going over the same story from different angles, and Dietrich is being nothing but cooperative and helpful. I think now is a good time to switch gears and acknowledge a few things to set the scene. Right now, at the time of this interrogation, the body that was found on the farm is still being ID'd. Heather Meyer only got a text that they found the body, and it may be Vander Heiden. Dietrich's family is also holding out hope at this point that the body is not of Vander Heiden, but in reality it is. Now, while the autopsy and the medical examiner reports are taking their time, the detectives are grilling the same story, bringing in more grieving members of the family and reiterating the same story countless times. With someone who's as cooperative as Dietrich here, the officer should think twice before dragging this inconsolable man through this pain over and over again. Unfortunately, they don't, and it's about to trigger a serious issue for Dietrich when they bring up the body that was found on the farm. And she doesn't have any tattoos, right? Nope. Any, she, uh, any scars from surgery or anything that you know of? No, just uh, she has a scar here from especially in her childhood, um, right, right by her eye. Right. Yeah. Yep. Well, 
Well, I think what we're looking at is uh, um, this body that was found okay. down the street. Um, I don't think it's been 100% identified as her, but there's a lot of similarities. What do you mean by a lot of similarities? There's a physical description. Height, uh, blonde, belly button ring. What happened? Well, we, I don't know. That's, that's what we're trying to figure out here. That's what we don't know. That's why we're conducting interviews like this with a lot of yeah. people to try to get to the bottom of this. You haven't talked to Aaron yet. That's my old well, red bed. We're working on it. Why why are you so concerned that we talked to Aaron? Well, he's the last person I've seen there that mm -hmm. I know. Okay. So, I mean, he's walking off that area. I want to know at least his story is through in. Mm -hmm. So basically what we know right now is what you've told us. And have you talked to anybody in that area at all that has have seen her walking away, anything of that sort? Mm -hmm. You have? No, I'm saying we have not yet. No, not yet. We haven't been over there at all. They haven't talked to Aaron, the last person who saw her. They haven't canvassed the neighborhood where the body was found, and they haven't gone through any CCTV footage from the bars where these events took place. This is what we mean when they say that these officers are making a bad attempt at solving this case by only rummaging through what he said and what she said. They haven't discovered anything concrete, which compels us to question how effective they will actually be in solving this case. Well, the next step in this is, um, you know, we've looked through your phone. Okay. okay. And we, we've seen pretty much everything in your phone that you talked about. All right. The text messages back and forth. and. Um, you know how she talked how she talked about your so-called friends and stuff yep. like that, and uh, um, you know so that's all that's all there. We've seen all that. Uh, the next step is to uh, search your house. Okay. Uh, and her car. All right. Well, I understand that. It could be a suspect. So, I understand that. Okay. So um, there was a search warrant written for your house. Okay. And they're headed over there now to search your house. Okay. Okay. So uh, it's my understanding that her parents have left. Okay. Your, my par your parents and Dylan are still there. Okay. Okay. So I think what they're going to ask them to do is go to their house. All right. Um, to your parents' house. Yeah. Um, we're going to need. We're going to need your clothes. Okay, uh, I, your shoes and your pants, whatever you need, I, and they'll look for that sh those two shirts. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and so they're right on top. It'll be the right on top of the hand. You don't have any kind of injuries anywhere, anything. Well, I mean, I mean, like scratch, like something that no, would look like no, you've been in a fight. I mean, you want, no. I mean, well, I played softball on Thursday, so that's a little dinged up my knee a little bit, but yeah. I just got some. Old stars. That's no. That, that's uh, that was time when anything fresh. Anything fresh. Yeah. Scratches or marks or anything like that. Is is would you consider Nikki to be a scrapper, a fighter? No. I mean, she works. She can hold her own on that. You know, she works out and likes to dance a lot. And so, I mean, she's just been getting back into the workout and having a child and all that. It's, that was something she was all, all about fitness, you know, mm -hmm. beforehand. Okay. Nice to do rollerblading and she was always going to get back in shape here. When you guys were out last night, I mean, did you notice? Anything out of the ordinary? Anybody, you know, talking to her that you didn't know? Anything suspicious like that? Well, 
So, I mean, there's a couple of friends that she said that there's like these two naked their girls, pretty much, and their mm-hmm. boyfriend, she asked, yeah, I don't even know. I mean, just quick hello and had a shot with the one group and went back to the show. That's, I mean, uh, I, besides those people that knew her at uh, the Sarink Camp, mm-hmm. that's, that's it. I mean, I didn't see her since then. The last time I saw her was walking out of the show. Not, I mean, it's like out of the, like, well, of course, inside mm-hmm. the building. Yeah, it was so freaking good. Is there anything else that you can think of that would be helpful to us in this? I don't know, I just, just, just bubble and she just it goes off and just said something or whatever, whoever she came across, I don't know. I need to talk, I'm going to talk to everybody on that freaking street in that neighborhood. I, I need to do it. Well, and that's, that's part of what we're going to do, too. You know, obviously, we can't go do it at, or at 2.30 in the morning. You know, we got it. Is there anything in your, when they go search your house, is they going to find anything, anything in their house, your house, that they're going to find that's going to, that's going to say you had anything? To Absolutely nothing whatsoever. <laughs> The detectives had exited the room twice before this to get their questions in order. But now, with the bombshell news that the body might be of Vanderheiden, it's starting to dawn on Dietrich that she might never return. Need anything else to drink or anything? Get some fresh air. Yeah, just give us a few minutes and I'll walk you outside. For all his cooperation, his one request out of all of this was, quote unquote, some fresh air, which was denied. Now, in normal cases, we'd side with the detectives to not let the possible suspects leave the room. But the only reason we want Dietrich to not be treated the same is because he has hyperventilation syndrome. He sits there sulking and hyperventilating for five minutes until a detective returns. Bear in mind, the interrogation's over. He's free to leave. But because they're going over the story, they're keeping him alone with his thoughts during such a dark time. He could have done some self-harm or something if he hadn't gotten up himself to go talk to the officers and get their attention. 
<laughs> Was there any other details you guys know? No. How would it happen? Possibly happen? No. Like I said, I don't even, I don't even know a hundred percent. You know, that it's her. Just the way they said it on the news, you know, I don't know, they grew some discovery. Wow, that's the newest trip yeah. looking for a looking for viewers. Yes. This time, the doors open as he hyperventilates, and this detective here just stands at the gate watching him break down. Knowing full well that he's hyperventilating, he should know better than to close the door as he left. I swear to God, I'm the pie who did this. All right, man, I got some bags. We're going to go in this room over here to switch out. Oh. Oh. 
Now, as intense as it was to watch, you can't imagine what this poor fella has experienced. He must have been dealing with a racing heartbeat, and we also saw that he had a hard time breathing. Yet the detectives just followed protocol. He was very close to just fainting inside the interrogation room, but he luckily kept it together enough to walk out. Dietrich's parents picked him up sometime between 3 and 4 a.m. after the interrogation and took him to their house. But along the ride, all he could think about was that they thought he did it. Unfortunately, he was right. Okay, here's the deal, Doug. Um, I'm Investigator Slinger, I'm with the Sheriff's Office. I'm also working this case along with Lieutenant White. Lieutenant White. I'm also working this case along with Lieutenant Tracy Stephan. He's such a little Okay. Um, right now, I'm going to be taking you into custody. I'll be handcuffing you. I'll explain all that to you in a bit. Um, and transporting you down to the Sheriff's Department. Okay. Okay. Be cooperative with me. All right. And we'll roll it that way. Wow, okay. All right. Um, I'm going to get you down there and we'll, we'll talk down there and I'll kind of explain to you what's going on. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a decent guy. Okay, and I'm, a, I'm a decent guy too. I, I, and I get I'm that. Kidding. I'm sure you are. Um, yes. You seem like a real nice guy. And uh, do you have a cup key? I do not. We'll get one. Actually, no. Based on the evidence they have, which are the angry text messages and testimonies of the family, the case against Doug Dietrich is that he committed first-degree murder after so many years of hatred and anger built up. This also incriminates his buddy Greg Matthew as an accessory, as he might have helped. However, as Dietrich was taken away in cuffs and the defense started preparing their case, the crime lab was able to produce their first breakthrough of the case. They tested the sock that Vander Heiden was wearing, and they found a match that belonged to a totally random person. This person was George Stephen Birch. At the time, Birch was interviewed by the department on June 8th of 2016 about a hit-and-run accident, a stolen vehicle report, and a car fire. Now, to prove that he wasn't involved in these incidents, he claimed to have been texting a woman from a bar on the night in question and offered to let the Green Bay police review his phone records to prove it. This means that the police had a record of everything on Birch's phone less than three weeks after Vander Heiden's murder. These records put Birch at a bar called Richard Cranium's, which is close to the sardine can, until the hours of Saturday morning, the night of Vander Heiden's disappearance. Then, his phone data puts him outside of Nikki and Doug's house from around 3 a.m. until 3.15 a.m., at the farm where her body was found, at the spot where her clothes were found around 4.05 a.m., and finally at his own house. Now, the only reason we're sharing all this instead of letting you hear it straight from the horse's mouth is that when Birch was brought in for questioning on September 7, 2016, he did what any smart criminal would do when caught. He requested a lawyer. Um, so, obviously, you are brought him in handcuffs, right? Um, which means you're arrested, so you have the right to your Miranda rights. Are you familiar with those rights at all? Okay, so before I speak to you any further about my investigation, I want to read your Miranda rights and see if you're willing to talk to me. Okay, the reason you're here is into uh, in reference to a homicide investigation into Nicole Vanderheiden. Okay, so is this something that you want to talk to me about? Yes, sir. What's that? You don't want to talk to me about mm -hmm. that. So if I read your Miranda rights, you don't you don't want to talk to me. So I would prefer a lawyer. Okay. Let me at least fill this form out here. His 36 minute long interrogation was an absolute waste, but through the power of location tracking, it was not even needed. George Birch went to trial on February 19th, 2018, where he finally, finally gave us the whole truth. The truth is that before May 21st of 2016, you never met Nicole Vanderheiden, correct? 20th and 21st, yes, sir. The first time you ever saw her was when you observed her in that bar that night at Richard Cranium's, correct? Yes, sir. The truth is 
that you were attracted to Nikki from the moment you saw her, right? I thought she was attractive, yes, sir. When did you decide that you were going to have sex with her? Um, later on, after we had hung out together and we had both expressed we were into each other. Is that when you went to your home, you were going to have sex with her when you got there? Uh, I hoped so. When you left your home, did you bring a condom with you? I think I did, but I don't recall. You drove Nikki home that night, right? That's the truth. Yes, sir. You drove her to an area that you'd never been to, that you were not familiar with at all, correct? Yes, sir. You drove her down Broadway, you crossed the bridge into Pier, correct? I believe so. I'm not familiar with the area, but if you say so. And you drove down Highway G past a bunch of businesses, past some residential areas? Um, I guess so, sir. I was more interested in talking to her in the conversations we were having. But if you say there's businesses there, I'm sure there is. Well, to be fair, Mr. Birch, not only did you drive her that night, but you're also familiar with all the maps in this case, with the location, with all the discovery that was provided. You know where that location is now, right? I couldn't go there right now if you told me you'd free me from this charge if I could find it. You drove Nicole out in front of her house, correct? Um, yes, sir. That's the truth. You parked there out in front of Berkeley Road, correct? Yes, sir. You had every intention of having sex with Nicole that night, correct? I was hoping that was the way it was going. That's the way it seemed like it was leading. Yes, sir. Did Nicole tell you that she had a young baby at home, that she was a nursing mother? I believe she had, had, had said something about it. The nursing part, I'm not sure. Um, but I do believe she said she had had a child because she had mentioned to me that she had a babysitter. I thought, you, I thought she told you that the kids were out of town with their dad. I said those two, but I also said when we got there, the light was on. She said the babysitter was up. Why would that be a problem? Why wouldn't you just ask the babysitter to go home and go inside? Sir, I don't know. I've never been in her house. I don't know her babysitter. So Nicole would rather have sex with you in front of her neighbor's home with your butt hanging out the door of the car than ask the babysitter to go home? Sir, I don't know. I wasn't the one making decisions. You mentioned that you... Uh, you started fooling around with Nikki, correct? Yes, sir. At some point, her shirt came off, right? Uh, yes, sir. She had on two shirts, right? A tank top and an overshirt? I believe so. I'm not exactly sure. But they were both completely off at some point, right? Uh, yes, sir. Were you touching her breasts? Um, a little bit. Did you note that they were engorged? Uh, I noticed they were big. I, I engorged, I'm... I wouldn't say I'd never seen them before, so I wasn't sure exactly what they were supposed to look like. She hadn't nursed in seven hours. I don't know that. Was there actual breast milk in her breast? I don't remember seeing any. In her breast, I couldn't tell you. I don't remember physically seeing any. I didn't spend a, a long time in her breast area. Did she tell you that she was uncomfortable? Not that I recall, sir. That they were sore when you touched her? Not that I recall. You said that you were having sexual intercourse with Nicole while she was in the backseat of that car, right? Eventually, yes, sir. And uh, what did she tell you about how painful it was? Um, she didn't express that she was any pain at all. You were here through Dr. Rogalska's testimony about the contusions and abrasions on her mom's pubis, right? Yes, sir. About the contusions on the vestibule, her urethral orifice, those contusions... Remember that? Yes, sir. The contusions on her lower vaginal vault. Do you remember that, right? Yes, sir. Blood in her vaginal vault. Do you remember that? I believe so. Deep, soft tissue contusions to her mom's pubis and abrasions to her left breast. You heard the doctor explain those injuries and explain that they would be painful injuries, even if they were consensual. You heard that, right? I believe that's what she said, but I'm not sure. Caused by penetration. Correct. And that was part of your not gentle sexual activity that you had with her, right? Excuse me, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? That was all a result of your not gentle sexual activity that you had with her? If that's the way you put it, yes, sir. I think that's the way you put it. Um, it wasn't gentle, no. It was painful. That I don't know. because it wasn't consensual, right? No, sir, that's not true. What really happened 
was you drove Nicole home 20 miles away from where you lived, fully expecting that you were going to have sex, right? That was your expectation. You were going to have sex. That's why you're driving her home, right? Um, I was hoping that we would. Um, it was leading from what had happened before and where we had spoken. It seemed like that's what was going to happen. And when you get there and it becomes clear that Nikki isn't going to have sex with you, when she attempts to go into her house and leave your vehicle, that's when your mood changes, right? No, sir. That's when things get aggressive, don't they? Not at all. That's when you grab that cord and strangle her, don't you? No, sir, not at all. That's when Nikki gets slammed on the ground repeatedly when she's trying to run toward her house, when those bloodstains lead in the direction back to her home. None of that is true. Well, how do you know? You were out cold when Nikki was assaulted. Because you said I did it. <clears throat> Nikki was strangled. She had a fractured jaw, correct? I don't know, sir. That's what the medical examiner said. But I can't speak for sure. I'm not a doctor. You heard all of that, right? Yes, sir. You saw her injuries. You sat through court to see the defensive injuries to her hands, to her feet, to her palms, to her fingernails, that she fought for her life, right? According to what the doctor said, yes. And you were just out cold during all of this? Yes, sir. And you say that Doug Dietry did this, but of course, you didn't see that happen either, did you? I cannot say for certain, no. And you'll have the jury believe that Doug Dietry sat there and did all of these things to his girlfriend while you were just out cold on the lawn hanging out. Uh, I wasn't hanging out. I had been knocked out from behind, sir, when I didn't know anyone was behind me. I, actually, you didn't say you were knocked out from behind. You, you didn't remember what happened. You I were having sex, and the next thing you knew, you woke up on the ground, right? It made me lead me to believe that I had been knocked out because I didn't pass out from standing there. But you don't recall any pain, so how do you know? I didn't recall any pain until later on that day when I got out of the situation that was not completely all worked up. And then you only recall just maybe a small little bump on the back of your head. I remember being painful in the back of my head. Not even a bump. Because that Jackson would have seen that. Uh, I'm, I'm six foot seven, so it's hard for somebody to see the top of my head. When they're sitting on a boat within 10 feet from you all afternoon? That I don't know, sir, what he saw. You never met Doug Dietrich before that night, right? No, sir. So rather than just beating you or killing you in the middle of the street, he decided to enlist you, a total stranger, to help him dispose of the body of his girlfriend. I don't know what his plans were. He had you drive them to a remote location, correct? Yes, sir. He thought it would be a good idea to have a complete stranger know where he's dumping a body? I don't know what he thought. You'd have to ask Mr. Dietrich about that. And you described taking Nicole's body. <laughs> You're the one who carried her body to her final resting place, did you not? If that was her final resting place, yes, sir. You dragged her into that field. You dumped her on the ground, right? I didn't drag her anywhere. You said your fireman's carried? I said I picked her up and carried her over there, and at the end, I dropped her feet. I didn't say anything about dragging her. You didn't say anything about dropping her feet. You said you had her by the arms. Which is it? My exact story, if you would go back and look, was that I picked her up, carried her out of the car, over to the position of roughly where it was, and let her go and had my arms under her towards the end. And then you dropped her feet and you're carrying her? I didn't go any farther. I said that already, sir. You stopped right there? Roughly... We didn't go much farther than anywhere, right there. How far down the embankment were you? Um, we were at the descend, so I don't know how far that goes down. I, I'd never been there before, so I couldn't tell you exactly how far I was down there, you, and it was dark. You were down the embankment? We were at the bottom. We were not at the bottom, no. It was still inclined. And Doug was coming down the embankment with you? He was standing in front of me as I was looking that direction. He was in front of me in the incline like this. He was not ahead of me. He was like right in front of me. Greg was reflected. The witness had one hand out and the other hand directly in front of him. I would say His other hand. Is one, one o'clock roughly, sir. One o'clock in front of me. Yes, sir. Hey, so just so we have a record. Go ahead. So clear this up for me. You're backing down the embankment with Nicole's body in a fireman's carry position, right? No. What are you doing? 
I told you before, and I will say it one more time for you, sir. I was carrying her over to this area. When I got to the final position, I let her legs go because I could barely carry her because it was all um, like going off and on, off and on. Like it was kind of hard to, to manage carrying her without losing my balance. That is when I let her go and I was still bracing her with this arm. I ended up putting both my arms under her shoulders. Douglas Dietschy was standing in front of me at this time. This trial had turned into George Birch versus Doug Dietry until the last days when one simple tech gadget exonerated Douglas Dietry. Throughout this entire charade, Dietry wore a Fitbit which actively recorded his steps and his location. He wore it during every interaction that he's had with the police and on the night of the murder. He had left his car at the watering hole, which was confirmed by video, and records obtained from Nikki's vehicle showed that it hadn't been used the night of her death. Greg's timeline also added up with Doug's, as the location data from their phones eventually corroborated their statements. It even showed that he'd only walked 12 steps and was sleeping between about 2.45 a.m. when he arrived home and 6.30 a.m. when he got up to feed their baby. And, despite the cops' suspicions, the crime lab couldn't find any evidence of Dietrich's DNA on Nikki's body, and it didn't match the unknown male DNA that was found on her. It was itself a struggle to introduce Fitbit data into such a high-profile case, but Dietrich's lawyer struggled until it was brought on record. After all of this, Birch was found guilty of first-degree intentional homicide on March 1st of 2018 and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. The verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, George Stephen Birch, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide, is charged in the information. It is signed by our foreperson and dated this first day of March 2018. He appealed his conviction, arguing that the cell phone data should have been excluded because it was gathered in a prior investigation and that prosecutors didn't properly authenticate the methodology behind the Fitbit step data. But the Supreme Court rejected his appeal. He is currently incarcerated at the Wisconsin Secure Program Facility. And Dietrich is a free man. In this lengthy case, the officers spent hours taking statements and comparing notes when they could have focused more on medical examiner tests, DNA sampling, and location tracking. If they had, they wouldn't have put poor Dietrich on such a guilt trip and could have gotten to the real criminal faster. Now, while a lot of people will argue that they were following protocol, perhaps the time has come for this protocol to change. The police took years to mandate body cams, but hopefully, with cases like these, they'll start prioritizing concrete evidence over he said, she said statements. Let us know what you think the police could have done differently in the comments down below. And once again, thanks for watching.